Thanks for having me along. Um, I'm from Hab Housing, uh, as well as from Grand Designs. Hab Housing is in Bristol. We're down by uh, Temple Mead Station. It's where we've chosen to base ourselves. I'm here today with our managing director, Mike, who has stood there. But it, Mike will answer all the difficult questions later, after I've left quickly afterwards. Um, I've, um, I've got some slides. And I wanted to talk to you today a little bit about home, a little bit about the smart home, a little bit about self-building custom build, which is very important for us as a way of empowering communities and bringing people together, and um, about the values that underscore what we do. We're a developer. Uh, we're also placemakers. We're also a constructor now. Um, so we build houses as well. I put up the first slide, which I've nicked from our brochure, which says, Hab is an ethical developer, house builder, and placemaker. We choose collaboration to work with communities, landowners, planners, and the best architects and landscape designers. We break molds, 21st century, blah, 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 neighborhoods, not just homes, resilient, low impact, locally distinctive, and a joy to live in. Yeah? Um, great public realm, that's important for us. Shared amenity, resources, transport, food growing, and play space, social sustainability. And you know what the key word there is? key word for me is the word shared, which we'll come to, in terms of creating not just smart homes, which are intelligent and efficient, but also places which are intelligent and efficient through the sharing of resources. And the final sentence is very important, because we wouldn't be doing it unless we love what we do. Um, it, you'll be pleased to hear it's the only slide with titchy writing on it. All the others have just got two or three words on, and they're mainly pictures. Now, uh, we subscribe to One Planet Living principles. You all know what they are. Uh, I presume I'm preaching to the One Planet Living converted audience here. Ten of them. Most of them cover things like carbon, wildlife, biodiversity, waste. Most of them, actually, are dedicated towards the saving and the conservation and the enhancement of our environment, towards the saving of crickets and polar bears. The last three, however, uh, are to do with health and happiness, culture, education, heritage, and they are dedicated towards, of course, the conservation of the most endangered species of all on the planet, which is us. So um, we place those values centrally to what we do because, essentially, they are, they, they, they're pretty coherent, they're understandable, and they're holistic. So, um, the other thing I should say is that we're a triple bottom line business. That is, we are dedicated, you'll be pleased to hear, Darren, to making a profit. But our profits are split three ways. They are social, of course, economic, and environmental. I think it's quite easy for us to, I think, you know, the world generally works according to economic principles. We understand what an economic bottom line profit is. There are balance sheets for that kind of thing. The balance sheet for the environment is harder to judge, it's harder to gauge but increasingly the metrics for that are becoming more sophisticated. Uh, WWF's uh, planet, Living Planet Index, for example, is a, is a pretty interesting metric, just one of them. But the third one, which I want to talk about quite a lot today, is this, the social bottom line, social sustainability, the social benefit of work. Now, that's a really, really hard one to measure. You can do it anecdotally, you can do it, um, you can do it actually in, in conversation with people, but it's really hard to get a fix on. And, and the only way we, we work really here is, first of all, by hunch, you know, figuring out what we would like and what our friends would like and what my mother would like if she lived somewhere, and then working with communities to ask them what they want and actually introducing ideas that perhaps they hadn't thought of in order to enhance their environment enhance their quality of life. As I said, custom build, self-build, is a big part of that for us. Um, and indeed, uh, ownership. I was really interested to, to listen to Keith and Chris's presentations earlier about what's happening in Bristol uh, in terms of the appropriation of land and the, 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 the importance of the land trust in organizing um, appropriation of land and the galvanizing of, of individuals into groups which is really important. So triple bottom line. Well, that social thing I was talking about is manifest here. This is a scheme that we did with 
Green Square Group it's our, and the Homes and Communities Agency and Gloucestershire Land for People. It's called Applewood. It was a hospital site in Stroud, in Cash's Green. And what you see here is the first summer after the scheme opened. And this is the central sort of courtyard into which a large number of the homes, there are 78 in all, but many of them back onto this car-free garden, shared garden. They've all got small gardens behind the picket fences, but they each lead on to a central set shared space. Isabel, our design director, was there um, just before the weekend, and she counted eight footballs in this one area. Um, we all commented this morning that when we were kids, if you had a football, you took it home. You didn't leave it, because it would get nicked. Here, the, it's the modern world, isn't it? You know, there's this kind of plethora of everything now, you know? The eight footballs. But it demonstrates how well the place is used. This is the residents having their own Applewood uh, concert, Applewood talent. What was it called, Mike? It was... Uh, yeah, Applewood's, Applewood's Got Talent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It became a sort of television-inspired uh, event. Um, but a great, great fun time, and uh, everybody there getting together. And for us, it's a real measure of that social sustainability, bringing people together in such a way that when they move in, they um, are already geared up, ready, may know some of their neighbours, are already beginning to share more than cups of teas and, and, and stories, but actually sharing, sharing resources as well. You know, um, there's a fantastic statistic that was done um, uh, by... A, 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 it was WWF together um, with, an, with another charity about um, neighbourhoods and they, they discovered that in the average street in Britain, your average householder knows seven other households. And um, for example, at Bedzet in Sutton, the average resident there knows 19 of the neighbours. And that's for us is a statistic that we want to repeat and, and improve on. That's a very important point that as a society uh, and as communities, we gain resilience, and we gain sustainability and, it's, it's, uh, and all the independence and strengths that come with that, not from building barricades, not from making our individual homes individually energy efficient, individually better insulated, individually higher performing, but by doing it collectively. So we build, for example, in our business, we build a lot of terraced housing because that automatically reduces the external skin of the building. It automatically reduces fuel bills, even before we've begun. So um, this collective nature of behaving and this collective nature of sharing is fundamental. And as far as we're concerned, probably the most smart thing we can do, given that there are seven and a half billion of us on the planet, with a limited amount of resources, perhaps we should sh start sharing some of those more. Um, anyway, enough of the uh, proselytising. We can go shopping now, OK? So uh, just forget everything I've said, and let's just enjoy a moment of material indulgence. Um, one thing that we are really inspired by is the car industry. And the reason we are is because when you, when you... Anybody here ever bought a new car? It took a long while for people to stick their hands up. But the point being that when you buy a new car, you have options. Um, I've done it once, and I have to say it was a surprise to me just how incredibly varied the choice is in the market. You can buy this car, you can buy any car from any manufacturer, with a possible, a minimum total of, say, 500 different choices. And with some of them, it's, it's into the millions if you take into account the, the spoilers and the different colour upholstery and the dashboard trim and the mirrors and the engine and the wheels and the tyres, and it goes on and on and on. And what we liked was the idea that here was a model actually for customisation, which would allow, if you like, um, which would allow anybody the opportunity to uh, come along and take basically a manufactured standard product, just like the houses that we can buy from the large manufacturers and customise it, change it, make it theirs, really personalise it. Now, people like, for example, I think Citroën now do the Saxo with funky coloured uh, yellow roof or a checkerboard front bonnet. The Mini is another great example of a car which is hugely customisable. So you can probably end up with a Mini on the road that nobody else has. It's yours, it's special. So I thought it would be interesting, personally inspired by this idea, to design my own car configurator. So um, I started with one of these. You may recognise this is, I think, the Chrysler 
I don't know what this is, Chrysler Dodge. The Dodgy, I'm going to call it the Chrysler Extension. And the reason it is because you park it next to your house, it's the size of a conservatory, <laughs> right? Um, and this is the Lamborghini uh, manhood, shall we call it? Yeah? We know what that is. Anyway, um, so in my car configurator, right? I've got four kids, sorry. Um, I thought, well, I'd, I'd like the Lamborghini front end, right? <laughs> I thought I'd done that rather well, actually. I think that's, I've got a career here as a car designer, right? So I got my own car configuration. I thought, well, it's not quite there yet. So I need a, there we are, that's better. I need a, that's a, a prophylactic bull bar on the front of it, on the, my manhood. Um, and a bit of chrome, extra bling, of course, because, you know, what is the 21st century without a, bit, without a bit of extra bling? And, oh, for that matter, a bit of carbon fibre. You can buy carbon fibre made in a factory in America, powered entirely by the sun, which is what the BMW i3 is made of. I don't know what these are made from. It's probably pretty fake. Um, oh, sat-nav, clearly. Um, electric, it has to be electric. I can't drive a car these days if, it's, if I can't plug it in. Come on. Particularly if it's a massive SUV thing like this is. Um, but I want it to go fast, therefore it's going to have these. And uh, I want a bit of, no, actually no, I want it to be greener. So what, um, that's better. It's better, yeah? But it's not quite the look I'm going for. That's fantastic. It's my, that's my vintage retro 19th century ash wheeled mobile, yeah? I've got, I've got the look there, right? Not surprisingly, um, no major car manufacturer has asked me to design their car for them. Um, but, um, so I thought, well, actually, uh, maybe what I should do is, is, is turn my attention to houses. Luckily, my colleagues have prevented me from doing that. We now employ brilliant architects, brilliant landscape architects. We've got a great design team. I'm not allowed to touch that process um, for the reasons that you've just seen. Um, but I do want to talk to you a little bit about how we go about it. So imagine that you get the opportunity to choose your house. This is a scheme that we did in Oxford with Oxford Citizens Housing Association, part of the Green Square Group. Um, this is not, this is one of our early projects, it's just coming to fruition and it's not a custom build scheme, but we've cut our teeth on projects like this, um, building uh, social housing, building affordable stuff, uh, working with lots of different typologies and lots of different ownership models uh, in partnership with um, housing associations. And we're still doing that. And from that learning and from working with great architects, we've been able to evolve our offer, as they say in commercial worlds. This is designed by Orford Hall Monaghan Morris. Uh, they've actually got an office in Bristol and we're working with them again on a scheme in Bristol. I'll come to that. Um, this is a really, really exciting experience for us. They've just won the Sterling Prize last year, so really first-rate architects. This is designed by Glenn Howells. This is our scheme in uh, Swindon, the Triangle. Again, there's no custom build here, but what there is is hempcrete houses, spacious tall ceilings, big windows, lots of light, spacious rooms, uh, lots of shared facilities. You can see the uh, very expensive car wash system here. Um, and. Um, uh, lots of biodiversity on a really, really tight site, mix of tenures, um, and uh, a, a great, great fun project for us. Our first thing that we did. And Applewood in Stroud, the one I showed you before, this is an external view of those houses that look onto that square where everybody was having fun in the most amazing location in Stroud. Again, uh, 78 homes here, a uh, mixture of tenures. Um, about a third of it is uh, social, affordable, and that is through Green Square Group again. We work with, and the Homes and Communities Agency, who were absolutely key in the development of this scheme. And you know, it's, the ideas that we're, we're, trying to, we're trying to push, ideas of sharing and of access and of you know, uh, collective ownership and collective control of space, that, those ideas don't always work. You know, you might chuck five ideas out there and expect three to work. So in fact, what we're discovering is we have to go back and actually say hello to these communities again and work with people like the Homes and Communities Agency to really just state that uh, ownership, that, that uh, the accessibility of the scheme. And we're still working with the owners and the residents and tenants on this site to, to ensure that that's the case. Um, it's a really, really fruitful learning process. It does involve staying with projects, 
you know, it's a bit like being a parent. You know, you never kind of fully say goodbye to those teenage children. They're always coming back for more money. Um, and in, in the case of projects, um, I, I think the conventional view is, is that you build and bugger off. Whereas we discover actually that it, it involves a much more, um, a, a much gentler and much longer term approach to working with communities. So this is a scheme, another one we're doing in Oxford, we're on site with at the moment. Um, and this is a larger scheme of 50 homes, which we're doing in conjunction with um, the community, the village where it is, it's just outside Winchester, and with a housing association there, Radian, uh, who are taking uh, of those 55 homes, I think 20 altogether. Uh, is that right, Mike? I'm terrible on numbers, yeah. Uh, 20 out of 50. 20 out of 50, thank you, yeah. I need to, I, I, I should have written this down on my cuff, you know. Um, Really, really interesting project where we've got a sort of two hectare, down to the lower left here, a two hectare wildlife park with wildflower meadows, uh, cycle track, walking, gardens leading onto that, BMX track, playing field, uh, there's some tennis courts beyond. Um, we've got a wildlife, uh, we've got an orchard, uh, car club, uh, bees, uh, and lots of communal play space as well. So this is really, really kind of elaborating our offer, if you like, uh, working up our, 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 our public realm ideas that we've, we've espoused all these years. Really exciting project for us. And so this is, this is what you get uh, when uh, you come to us and say, what can we do at Winchester? We've, we've, I mentioned self-build, and, and you, know, you know me for taking you by the hand and leading you through the mud for an hour while some hapless folk sell their grandmother and construct their, 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 their vanity project in the middle of a field. And it costs a fortune. And we very early on established that we, we really didn't want to do that with residents and we didn't think it was fair to do that with residents. I, I have had some amazing experiences for example, down in Brighton with the Hedgehog Housing Co-op, where um, we've seen people come together from the social housing list and through sweat equity build their own homes. And um, in fact, I have to say the most, probably the most um, life-affirming grand design I ever did was the revisit to that project, which was in 2013, 12 years after they finished it. Every single of those 10 households still in the same homes. All those kids who'd come out of really difficult threatened accommodation had grown up in this enormously resilient community based really on that fundamental principle of sharing where they had a communal garden, communal kids play space, fire pit, beehive, studio, shed, whatever. Trampoline, communal trampoline. How would, what, 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 you know, that for me is, it's a dream. You know, one communal trampoline per scheme. Wow, will it ever happen? And so we, we pulled away from that hard core self-build offer, thinking that if we're going to stay and survive as a business, what we need to do is to contain this. So what you have here is you've got a footprint, three footprints, one, two, three, of the same house. That is ground floor, first floor, ground floor, first floor, ground floor, first floor. Got that? One, two, three. It's the same building for the same price. You can have a ground floor which is cellular and enclosed, or it can be semi-open plan or even more open plan. It can have a first floor, which is organized differently as well. So we have lots of configurations we can do. We can change the cladding a bit, I only say a bit, because planners haven't quite caught up with this kind of custom build idea yet, but they will. Um, eventually, we'll be able to offer all kinds of different treatments, all kinds of different articulations of a, of a house for people to get involved with. They don't have to roll their sleeves up. They don't have to get their hands dirty and stick around in the mud. We can build them a template of concrete. We can give them a slab with all the services already put in. We can give them as much or as little as they want. I mean, it's possible, for example, to, um, to take a house that's a shell and to kit it out, fit it out yourselves, or maybe decorate it yourself. We're experimenting at the moment with, um, well, sorry, experimenting, we're, we're actually proposing a scheme uh, at Graven Hill in Oxfordshire for Cherwell District Council on, that's a BISTA, you know, it's a big self-build destination where they plan to put up 2,000 self-build homes or custom-build homes. And what we want to do is to facilitate the custom-build at a community or group level. So you get 10 households coming together or five households, the equivalent of the German 
Baugruppen that you find in Berlin, people coming together and, and wanting to be clients collectively of a scheme. It's incredibly empowering for groups. It's enormously um, uh, de-risked and de-stressed because it's effectively managed and, I don't like this word, I'm going to use it, curated, it's a very, very 21st century word, that curated method of building. And what this shows you is, is the promise of us being able to do that on a much wider scale. At the moment, we say we've got uh, five homes in Oxford, we've got 55 homes in, uh, down in Winchester, and we really, really want to roll this out now across every scheme we do. Uh, so, no inappropriate extensions. Just happiness, architecture, and beauty, which is what HAB stands for. It also stands for sustainability, but if we'd included that, it wouldn't have spelled HAB. It would have spelled SHAB. Anyway, um, BISTA, as I mentioned, really key project for us that we want to do. Um, and we've discussed, for example, whether we can make it easier for people to find more storage inside and out, whether it's for kids' toys, beds, or for your canoe. Whatever it is, we ought to be able to provide a system that is affordable and accessible and which you can understand and bolt on and take with you even when you change and move houses. Or for that matter, a garden hideaway. You know, that kind of granny annex stroke, special place to take your mates and get drunk or for the kids to go and uh, lock themselves in and listen to rock music 24 hours a day. Um, and North Bristol is, is another really key uh, area that we're looking at. We're in talks at the moment with the City Council and with United Communities, the Housing Association, and uh, what was Great Western Regional Capital is now Bristol and Bath Regional Capital to build 150 homes in Dunmail, uh, which is in Southmead, just south of the Filton site. And um, broadly speaking, a third of these will be open market, that is for sale, a third of them will be uh, for United Communities, and that's split between um, shared ownership and social rental. And a third of them will be made available to Bristol and Bath Regional Capital to deliver into the private rented sector. They're going to be effectively the landlord, albeit a, um, a benign and a progressive landlord who want to uh, rent at below market rates. So, uh, it's, it's a really, really interesting model for us that we're able to take effectively a conservative government's demands to dispose of housing through the private rented sector and actually create a model which delivers relative affordability uh, using that, uh, th that, that system. And um, it's going to be a, a really landmark scheme for Bristol. It's going to be a huge scheme for us. It's 150 homes. Um, big for United as well big for the city, and, uh, and we hope it's, it's, it's going to serve as a, as a template, uh, uh, or at least a, an exemplar for, for other schemes in the city and actually across the country. So, um, look, I'm not going to talk about tech very much, partly because I'm not quite, I'm not really very high tech. I'm, I enjoy the, an interface when it's really easy. So I've got one of these, you know. I don't need to know how it works inside, thanks very much. Um, I've got children for that. And um, ho however, I'm very interested in the way that buildings work and the way that we as human beings interact with buildings. You know, in Germany, the, the Germans really love to operate their buildings like machines. They really enjoy monitoring and controlling them and, you know, using their iPhone. We don't. Now, the traditional British approach to uh, managing the temperature in our buildings is to move in you move into an eco house, turn the heating up to full, and control the temperature by opening the windows. Standard. And it, it, we are very, very primitive. It's not the way we work. So um, what, I, what we believe is that, is that we should be designing our buildings accordingly. And we have built some fairly demanding buildings in our time, which we've realized are perhaps exercised too much uh, of their occupants. Uh, and so it's really important to take a very, very simple approach wherever possible. You know, um, right now we're in the middle of, a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of an exploration into uh, how we can be building in five years' time, and um, I'll come on to that sh shortly, but it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's wherever possible we try and find the simplest possible solutions. So um, 
Here's one of our houses, for example, that demonstrates um, a, a passive uh, stack ventilation system, which I'm sure you will all be familiar with, where you introduce fresh air at ground level and the warm air, the bubble of warm air in the building rises up, up at the top and sucks in a little bit at the bottom. It's not, it's not passive. It's not, it's not a sealed box where you're managing this with, with uh, controlled ventilation. This is a, a much more uh, open method. It's one which at the Triangle in Swindon and indeed at, at Cash's Green we've used uh, as a summer ventilation strategy and in the winter we've shut the buildings and then relied on mechanical ventilation. Uh, we're now looking at ways in which we can actually uh, adapt this method uh, because there are technologies out there that effectively provide this kind of ventilation all year round. Really, really super simple, super cheap to run. Um, you've got to match it, of course, with a relatively high degree of thermal mass in the building, and you've got to super insulate the building. This isn't super insulated because it's had the end chopped off. Um, <laughs> but in every other respect, it's a very high performing building. Um, so our method uh, is a pretty commonly understood term, which is fabric first, which is you build well, you insulate well, you provide a degree of thermal stability in the building using materials that will hang on to heat. Uh, and that way you create an environment which can be ventilated healthily and uh, improve the, the physical quality of life of its occupants and deliver extremely low energy bills, of course. Um, our uh, COP21 pledge, which we made, uh, in conjunction with the Paris climate, we thought we might have eclipsed it, but we didn't, uh, never mind. Um, it was that in 2018, we wanted to be building our first energy positive scheme, and that we wanted it to be the norm by 2020. We suddenly realized that's not very far away. Um, so we're working quite hard at the moment to figure out what that means. Um, but there's nothing like a pledge, is there? You know, nothing like laying it down first and then trying to figure it out afterwards. You know, better to beg for forgiveness than ask for permission. So um, we think that we're moving towards a type of house which is going to be clearly highly insulated, probably stack ventilated in some way that introduces fresh air in a clever way with minimum energy. Um, that probably uses a 24-volt direct current system in the building as well as 240 to charge your iPhone and your laptop because 24-volt uh, high ampage is coming our way with the new USB, if you didn't know. I didn't. And um, on top of that, uh, we're also looking at infrared heating when necessary and really innovative ways of heating hot water which minimize energy. Now, those are all within the envelope of the building. And what's, what, when it gets interesting, of course, is when you start talking about what a scheme can do. Uh, I mentioned the scheme that we're doing down in Winchester, where we're putting photos. That, that's their Code 5 homes, or rather they are old Code 5 homes, or whatever it is now, I don't know. They've got photovoltaics on the roofs, which is fantastic. That's making a real contribution to the energy of the scheme. However, the energy company in the area restricts the number that we can fit on a scheme so that the total must not exceed 226 kilowatts because they're worried about energy flux and, you know, kind of inconsistencies in the system at a local level. So we have yet, I mean, as, as Toby was saying, we have yet to, to really work out um, nationally how we're going to integrate um, schemes with um, the larger grids. And at the same time, um, we also have to figure out how we're going to um, split the responsibility between household and, and, and across the scheme. Look, it, it's really easy to build an energy positive house. It's really easy to build an energy positive scheme. We can all do it right now. You just need to spend five times as much money, right? That's simple. The hard thing is doing it at the same price as we've been doing houses traditionally. That's the key. That's the real goal is being able to do this in a way which really delivers um, alleviation from fuel poverty and which really puts cash back in people's pockets and delivers a true energy positive zero carbon living. I, was, I noticed actually in the, in, the, in, the, in the blurb about today it said that I was going to talk about um, alleviating full poverty. <laughs> That's an interesting option. Um, 
And I want to talk about this, uh, coming back to social sustainability, because you don't do any of this stuff unless you get people on your side, unless you make it really easy for people, unless, um, unless people stop you know, turning the heating up and controlling the temperature by opening the windows. You've got to get a collective understanding and mutual support. And so social fabric first is hugely important for us. And how do we do that? Well, we don't do it, actually, with passive stoke ventilation systems. And we don't do it with MVHR. And we don't do it with super insulating. What we do it with is trees and grass and play space and polytunnels and, and car clubs. All the stuff that happens in between the buildings, all the public realm stuff. And this is where we get really excited. Because this is where you can really, really begin to deliver the, the bigger benefit. So this is Cash's Green, the one I talked about in Stroud. There are the houses around the, that, that square where the tent was up. Here's the badger set through here. So here's a wildlife corridor. And here are the allotments here, uh, some of which are, are, are already in action already there, given to local residents in the area, some of which are shortly coming online. Here's the allotment building, which I like very much because it's made out of recycled bricks from the site and it's not just an allotment building, it's a social space and you can have barbecues there and it's just a great, great social building. Um, really, really great example, actually, on a relatively small scale, 78 homes of providing facilities that aren't just for our residents but for the wider community around it as well. So we have car club, uh, shortly to have, I think, we hope, an electric bike club that's next on the agenda. Um, big impact. So we take the design of the public realm structurally really importantly too with swales and planting and the way in which we manage runoff water and uh, runoff from the roads, for example, parking strategies and so on. Really, really important. And the result of that is a lot of shared amenity. That very naughty boy up there is about to drench that lady's shopping. But that is crated water from the roofs. Edible hedgerows, bike storage, fruity streets, shared surfaces, getting that word shared into as many aspects of what we do as possible, whether it's veg gardening or cars. Oh, and there's the allotment building. I've, so, I've forgotten I put a picture of that in, actually. It's a great little building, just, just getting ready now. And it's got a lovely brick hearth in it for Barbies. So, um, okay, so we've established that I, I'm, I haven't been allowed to design houses, and I certainly haven't been asked to design cars, but I can design a tree, okay? So I am, I am, I'm here to show you my tree configurator. If you don't believe everything I've said so far about social sustainability and public realm, this will convince you. Okay, that there, that tree there is a willow, right? Anybody know how many species of invertebrate a will, willow uh, supports? I know this, I know this because I looked it up at the back 10 minutes ago. Uh, it's 264. I don't write it down because you, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to check it now. <laughs> um, it's 200, I think it's 264. And um, I, I, I should know this, but I can never remember. Oh, 266, damn. Okay. An oak, an oak supports 284 species of invertebrate. Okay, and any entomologist knows that the more invertebrates you have, the more birds you have, the more birds you have, the more mammals you have. They're at the bottom of the food chain, the invertebrates. So they determine the biodiversity of your site. Okay, really important. Now you might think, oh yeah, yeah it's 284, 266, that's great. Do you know how many species of invertebrate a holm oak supports? Seven. Um, a horse chestnut? Anybody? Four. Four. Four species of invertebrate. And a rhododendron, none. It's a really, really powerful tree. It's figured out how to dispel every living thing on the planet. Um, so the point is actually after willow. The next one is birch at 229. Then it drops to hawthorn at 149. Ash is only 41, 41. And actually, when you look, when you, if you I didn't realize this until this morning. If you include not just all invertebrates, but also mites, yeah, the number leaps to 450 for a willow, which puts it ahead of the oak. In other words, it's top of the tree, excuse the pun. Isn't that fantastic? And a willow costs what? I mean, you buy one for about £1.60 from Chew Valley Trees. And at the moment, it's relatively immune to the diseases which are afflicting ash, oak,
Well, yeah, I mean, I don't want to put it right in the front garden. I mean, I'm imagining here, we, we put them in our swales and in our, our, our larger, you know, areas of public realm. Yeah, no, no, it's a very good point. Yeah, yeah. Same goes for all trees. But, you know, let's not, let's not no, banish the tree. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's it. Yeah, but, we, but uh, I'll, come, I'll come on to that in just a second because we don't plant them next to drains, okay? So this is our willow, and this is the swale, right? Uh, you'll notice the willow is not next to the swale. The willow is in the swale. Why, you may ask? It's so that it can drink the water in the swale. Now, the swale is a little device in the landscape which, when it rains, it fills up deliberately with water. It's a kind of water attenuation device. It's a lovely thing because kids can play in it, it attracts reeds and uh, rushes. Great, great thing. But in absorbing all that water, of course, what the willow does is create a little microclimate. If you've read anything about trees, you'll also know they produce a lot of chemicals, and the willow produces quite a lot of chemicals, which are very beneficial for mammals. That includes us, because we're mammals. And in this lovely gaseous cloud of, of uh, intoxication, that we, uh, we can enjoy amongst trees. Uh, the willow is a pretty important uh, component. By creating a moist atmosphere through gently uh, aspiring, uh, through aspiration through the leaves of the water as it, as it breathes, as it sucks all that up, of course it's cooling the air around it, which is an important point in those months when the willow has leaves on the trees in summer. So that's creating a microclimate, reducing the need for additional cooling in our buildings in those hot summers we're going to have more of. Oh, and it'll, of course, support beautiful wildlife, all those invertebrates and the birds that will come as well at the same time, providing uh, delight and beauty for us all. And shade, let's not forget that, that actually it's somewhere to go and sit that's cool, that's beautiful, and that as you sit in the shade, you can admire the sun glinting through those leaves. And it's an amenity, it's a play space, it provides somewhere for kids to go and muck about, whether it's in the water or on the tree. And it's somewhere to go and sit if you've got a headache. Because if you, I don't know how many, it's not a commonly known fact, but it used to be said that if you had a headache, go and sit under a willow tree. And do you know why? Because until the 1940s, aspirin was made from the bark of willows, salicylic acid. You go and chew a willow, you feel a lot better. It's what my dear do, and where I live. And um, it, it's, uh, that's really part of that whole um, that cloud of, of goodness that it provides. And of course, it's a fuel source, particularly used in coppice timber for biomass fuel, because it's so, so quick growing. And all of that, all of that, for about £1.60, all right, including the stake and the little fence that goes around it. Let's call it three quid, shall we? Fantastic value. That I call smart. Thank you very much.